নমস্কার শুভ সন্ধ্যা সুচি সোসাইটি ফর আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ডিং কালচার অ্যান্ড হিস্ট্রি ইন ইন্ডিয়ার সুচি উদ্যোগ তথা আমাদের পরম্পরার আজ এক বিশেষ অনুষ্ঠান আজ আমাদের মধ্যে আমাদের সঙ্গে উপস্থিত হয়েছেন প্রখ্যাত ইতিহাসবিদ অধ্যাপক হরবংশ মুখিয়া আজ আমাদের এই বিশেষ উরনাময়ী আলোচনা চক্রে ওনার বিষয় মধ্যকালীন ভারতে সমাজ ও সংস্কৃতির অনুধাবন তথা আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ডিং মেডাইভেল ইন্ডিয়ান সোসাইটি অ্যান্ড কালচার অবশ্যই আমরা জানি যে ওনার সম্পর্কে নতুন করে বলার কিছু নেই তাও সামান্য কিছু কথা বলে নিতে চাই অধ্যাপক মুখিয়ার উচ্চ শিক্ষা এবং পিএইচডি সবই দিল্লি বিশ্ববিদ্যালয় এবং তারপরে তার সুদীর্ঘ কর্মজীবনে তিনি জওহরলাল নেহেরু বিশ্ববিদ্যালয়ে অধ্যাপনার দায়িত্ব সামলেছেন ওনার বিভিন্ন বইয়ের মধ্যে দিয়ে আমরা প্রত্যেকেই ভারতের মধ্যযুগের ইতিহাসকে নতুনভাবে জানতে নতুনভাবে ভাবতে শিখেছি এছাড়া অধ্যাপক মুখিয়া উনিশশো নিরানব্বই থেকে দু সালের মধ্যে জওহরলাল নেহেরু বিশ্ববিদ্যালয়েরই রেক্টর পদে আসীন ছিলেন তিনি ইউজিসি ন্যাশনাল লেকচারারও হয়েছিলেন উনিশশো পঁচাশি ছিয়াশি সালে আর উনিশশো আশি থেকে দু সাল পর্যন্ত তিনি প্যারিসের ইএইচ ই ডাবল এস এই সংগঠনে ডিরেক্টর হিসাবে যুক্ত ছিলেন ওনার বিবিধ বই যেগুলো আমরা কিছু আগেই দেখানোর চেষ্টা করেছি সেগুলো সম্পর্কে বলি প্রথম বই হিস্টোরিয়ান্স অ্যান্ড হিস্টোরিওগ্রাফ আরো যা যা লিখেছেন তার মধ্যে পিপল ইন্ডিয়া লিখেছেন পার্সপেকটিভ অন মেডাইভেল হিস্ট্রি ইস্যুজ ইন ইন্ডিয়ান হিস্ট্রি পলিটিক্স অ্যান্ড সোসাইটি লিখেছেন এক্সপ্লোরিং ইন্ডিয়াজ মেডাইভেল সেঞ্চুরিজ এসেস ইন হিস্ট্রি সোসাইটি কালচার অ্যান্ড টেকনোলজি আর তার নতুন গ্রন্থের মধ্যে রয়েছে আ বিট অফ হিস্ট্রি আ বিট অফ পলিটিক্স শুধুমাত্র বইয়ের লেখক হিসাবেই নয় তাকে আমরা সম্পাদকের দায়িত্ব সামলাতেও দেখি বিভিন্ন গ্রন্থের এবং বিভিন্ন জার্নালে তার মধ্যে কিছু উল্লেখ করা যেতে পারে ওই তো প্রত্যয় ওয়েলকাম অল সকলকেই আমাদের স্টুডিওতে আমরা স্বাগত জানাই প্রফেসর হরবেন্স মুখিয়ার আজকে আলোচনা রয়েছে এবং আমাদের মধ্যে আলোচনার এই আসরে উপস্থিত রয়েছেন অধ্যাপক রণবীর চক্রবর্তী অধ্যাপিকা উত্তরা চক্রবর্তী অধ্যাপিকা সুচন্দ্রা ঘোষ এবং অধ্যাপক প্রত্যয়নাথ আমরা যে আলোচনা আজকে করতে চলেছি মধ্যকালীন ভারতের সমাজ ও সংস্কৃতির অনুধাবন আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ডিং মিডিয়াবল ইন্ডিয়ান সোসাইটি অ্যান্ড কালচার উইথ প্রফেসর হরবন্স মুখিয়া জাস্ট বিফোর হিজ ডিসকাশন উই আর গোয়িং টু হ্যাভ সাম পার্সোনাল ইন্টারাকশন উইথ প্রফেসর হরবন্স মুখিয়া আমরা বাংলা ইংরেজি হিন্দি মিলিয়ে তার সাথে একটু কথোপকথনে যাব সুচির এটা নিজস্বতা সেই নিজস্বতার মধ্য দিয়ে আমরা 
আমাদের আজকের অনুষ্ঠান শুরু করব এবং বিশেষ করে হারবন্স মুখিয়া স্যারের সঙ্গে আমরা যেখানে এরকম ভাবে একটা ছোট্ট আড্ডার মতো করে উঠতে পাচ্ছি সেটা একটা দারুণ ভালো লাগা এবং সবথেকে বড় কথা যেটা স্যার বাংলায় বেশ ভালোভাবেই আড্ডা দিতে পারেন তো সেটা আমাদের একটা পাওনা হতে পারে উত্তরা চক্রবর্তী উত্তরা দিকে আমরা অনুরোধ করবো এবং রণবীর তাকে অনুরোধ করবো আমাদের আড্ডাটা রণবিদ্যাপ্লিজ Uh, professor mukhia's books to my students and i was just telling him that hopefully he will not be speaking on feudalism because that's a very complicated <laughs> subject <laughs> and um, i had a great I mean, a trouble time in explaining the whole thing to the uh, to my girls uh, to the students so, however the problem you know when i started teaching in presidency college as a great uh, guest lecturer uh, i found that uh, they were they could uh, take it in very quickly very easily uh, the boys at yes. uh, yes. presidency and before i could mention uh, your books they said yes we have gone through them we have already seen <laughs> these books <laughs> well actually well, sir uh, that's very Will present to know uh, uh, <laughs> one writes books so that they are read and if they are read that's uh, that's very pleasing to the author uh, yes so yeah. i'm very glad to know that your student yes. they are very bright actually you know the younger generation of scholars and students these days <laughs> they are a very very bright lot you know and i find them extremely bright very very uh, knowledgeable uh very, very deep very sense good, yes. of questioning is is sense of questioning uh received wisdom is uh, is very characteristic of them and that's very pleasing you know yeah, so actually i true. i feel very uh, sometimes very humble that you know uh, I, I, when i i was their age i now that i look back upon my uh, you know my young age and and so on as a young teacher and young scholar and so on i feel myself so limited really in my knowledge my knowledge was so extremely limited my perspective was so extremely limited i feel very envious of the young students who are coming up now students even undergraduate students are very bright now and of course scholars uh, research scholars and young teachers and research scholars they are absolutely uh, so absolutely breathtaking so i think this notion that uh, history yeah. is dying as a subject i i completely disagree with that i think history is a very live subject and it's a very live subject because uh, young people are making it very very live very very interesting and very very profoundly challenging to uh, the wisdom they have received including from my books you know so it's wonderful to know, <laughs> know that so yeah. you'll be very happy to know that at hyderabad we have in third semester uh, we have a few students who have actually come from physics one uh -huh. completed his engineering and yesterday he was uh -huh. telling me that my parents wanted me to become a engineer so i have satisfied them i wanted to study uh -huh. history so now i have joined uh -huh. history and he is in third semester so i was um, it was Fantastic. amazing and he asked me so much of epigraphy That's and cool. other things so it was yeah. so encouraging for us that people are yes, actually absolutely. to study yeah Absolutely. and uh, yes take cue yes. from uttaradi actually your feudalism debate is like 
it all helps us in classes i think suratta also remembers suratta yeah. sat in my class yeah. in uh, in during his masters he had this special paper early medieval and i used to teach uh -huh. them a feudalism debate and the the one the most important thing was you had that whole uh, this, uh, the first chapter the prologomena which was there in their book the feudalism yeah. debate and i to give them yes. first the first read this it, you have a very succinct account of the entire debate written here then i will go step yeah. wise so that uh -huh. was amazing uh -huh. actually that's uh -huh. help uh -huh. you know yes Yes. Uh, you you were talking about this science student, this engineering student, yeah. uh, or an engineer. He was an accomplished engineer um, coming back to study history. Well, we have instances of scientists uh, taking up history. We have right. uh, the Reverend uh, Osambi, Dr. Yes, he was a mathematician. Of course, yeah, yeah. That, that yes, is of course, yes. the stellar yes. example. Well, he is a stellar yes. example but you know uh, we also had a student uh, uh, in jnu he had joined ma in ancient history he had done four years of mbbs his parents wanted to, him to become doctor he had done four years of mbbs he was into the fifth <coughs> and final year and he quit that finally and he said no i don't want to become a doctor and he came and studied ancient indian history at jnu you know? so there are outstanding just, examples though yeah. so, you know uh, so i just wanted to i just wanted to emphasize that history is far from dead history is history is a very live very live discipline you know and attracting is, very very is. bright students yes it's, on that note professor mukhi i have a question for you i mean you have been writing yeah. you have been teaching for for many years yeah. now how do you see the discipline evolving in the last uh, several decades oh okay uh, well <laughs> it's a if you know it's a huge question uh, actually i it's on this study theme that i've given uh, two i i think two lectures on this uh, on this social media on this uh, internet yeah the same mm. same technology two mm. lectures on this very theme how uh, history <coughs> writing has been changing in the last 50 60 years you know uh, well uh, in a way uh, uh, let me let me put it somewhat autobiographically uh, in the second half of the 1950s i was studying ba and ma in delhi university as a student of history and we studied all those kings and queens and their battles and wars and accession and deposition and you know all that uh, who killed whom and and so on so forth very boring kind of history you know. and suddenly uh, in the late 50s and early 60s there was a sea change altogether a sea change you know when all of these uh, themes were dumped actually and what we started talking of class and class struggle and peasant uprisings and uh, and uh, state oppression of the peasantry and peasant uprising and you know uh, one excellent <laughs> example i'll give you is I, i was in my final year of nine, in 1960 at uh, final year of ma and there used to be a standard question for ma final year students medieval history students explain the causes of the fall of mogal empire and we all would repeat uh, jadunar sarkar's you know aurangzeb's religious policy had antagonized hindus hindu reaction expansion into the deccan etc etc you know that was a standard explanation just a few months before uh, before the exam i came across an article in two parts uh, called agrarian causes of the fall of mogal empire by a young by a person whom we had not heard of namely irfan habib you know he wrote this uh, two piece article in a journal called enquiry which is which has been which is an excellent journal but it has been dead for a long time it was edited by bipin chandra started and edited by bipin chandra and randeer singh and you know uh, uh, this i i almost cried reading this article you know because uh, a new world opened up before us you know where aurangzeb's religious policy akbar's religious policy jahangir's religious policy became irrelevant totally irrelevant you know uh, who was liberal who are orthodox who antagonized 
boom etc became irrelevant totally you know and you suddenly a new a new threshold was crossed in history as it were you know uh, uh, a new what what came to be called social economic history and now in the so i i saw a threshold being crossed in the 19 late 1960s late 1950s and 60s with didi koshambi's book certainly as the as the sort of you know trigger of it but other books like r s sharma and, and uh, irfan habib and so on and then in the 1980s late 80s 90s another threshold was crossed you know when uh, this sort of uh, very hardcore oxy, uh, orthodox marxist kind of uh, total uh, class struggle between the state as one class and peasantry as the other class and technicistic classes that uh, became inadequate marxism itself itself was under questioning then but marxist history also became uh, came under questioning but more than that new themes began to emerge in history writing you know new themes which marxism wasn't really well equipped to deal with themes like the question of uh, the question of ecology the question of women the question of uh, 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 concepts of time and space in history the question of uh, you know uh, the nature of states not not the not the uh, political events and wars and battles but what kind of state is uh, it was you know the nature of including even uh, one historian as you know uh, called it the yeah there is a call anyway so you know the uh, so a new new sets of themes emerged from, from the 1980s onwards 1990s and in the 21st century so a second threshold was crossed in the 19 in, in this period so history in the last 50 60 years has undergone a sea change it's a different world altogether from the kind of history that we studied as students and the kind of history that uh, we ended up teaching but more than ended up teaching i ended up teaching 16 17 years ago in the last 20 years or so particularly the kind of history the kind of themes that they are taking up you know monsoons the how do mount monsoons affect uh, uh, production and society and social structures how do ideas uh, uh, different ideas affect so uh, framing of social structures and so on so forth so it's a different world altogether i spoke only of medieval india here but this is true across across uh, ancient and modern uh, period as well you know so it's a different different kind of it's a different world altogether and that's very pleasing you know as as i said earlier history is a live discipline yes it's very true. very very quickly very briefly yes uttaradi yes uttaradi yes um i was reading an article by you where you have talked about um about um, there is uh, nothing uh, i mean not nothing you said uh, every it's can in history is modern in its own sense oh um, i see okay yes <laughs> <laughs> yes that is very yes. interesting i like that uh-huh. you know the even in during uh, medieval time or during ancient time the people thought they were uh, they were modern they were the late, uh, having the latest uh, things yes yes uh, yes actually you know uh, apart from apart from, from, from my whatever research and books and so on so professional writing and so on so forth i also often write in newspapers uh, if only to let my friends know that i if not uh, my write my books and so on so that you know this was one of the newspaper writings i think the yes. in the hindu it came uh, out in the where hindu, i said, yes. you know yeah i think you know the uh, my uh, my suggestion you know the whole the whole concept of modernity is, is a very uh, <coughs> it is a very provincialized concept and very uh, 
temporally restricted concept. That's to say, modernity came to the world uh, via Europe, through Europe. Europe brought in mod modernity to the world uh, in the, from the 17th or maybe 18th, 19th century, 20th century. So modernity is a product of Europe and especially and temporally it's a product of 18th, 19th, 20th century. You know? So it's a specifically European uh, contribution to the modern world that we live in. You know? Now that is what we have learned so far. You know? On the, in the last 20, 30 years, there has been some questioning. But until then, uh, this was what modernity meant to us. You know? But uh, you know, now this concept of modernity is changing the world over. It's being challenged the world over. You know? And uh, you know, the assumption here is that since Europe was the source of modernity in a certain period, other regions were unmodern, uh, were medieval, had contributed nothing to it, etc., etc. You know, uh, it's a specifically European phenomenon. Now that is under questioning, and I was really suggesting that the whole, all human civilizations, all throughout time, throughout time. Uh, across time and across space, they have contributed something or the other to the modern world that we live in. Yes, you uh, mentioned that. Yeah, I mentioned that. You know, uh, every everything, every everything uh, that we uh, uh, that we see or witness or enjoy today has some elements from some part of the world or some time of the mm -hmm. uh, of history or the other uh, in our everyday life. You know, including in our food. So that including in our food, in our dress, in the way we speak, everything, you know. So in a way, the whole world has been modernizing ever since uh, history began, you know. Uh, it's not a specifically European phenomenon, and it's not a specifically temporally uh, limited phenomenon, 18th, 19th, 20th century. It's a phenomenon which is far more universal, spatially and temporally. So that is... Uh, that. Uh, that was uh, and my some of my titles tend to be challenging. Like, was there feudalism in Indian history? Is a very challenging Absolutely. title. So, yes. so this title was also kind of challenging. You know, there wasn't the whole world modern at all times. You know, so this was just to just to just to put a question mark on our received wisdom and and uh, start thinking again. You know, that was that was the idea. So yes. I did write that, but it's not a research paper. It's just a casual kind of, you know, uh, you sit down before the computer and write out something. <laughs> so yes. it was that kind of uh, paper. Yeah. Yes. Okay. But thank you for remembering it. But the thoughts come after. Sorry, say it again. I, I I wanted to say that it might be a casual uh, thought about you, but these thoughts come well, after. Well, okay. <laughs> Well, okay, of yes, uh, my uh, white hair does uh, give me the certificate <laughs> of having, <laughs> having studied and thought and so on and so forth for long enough. <laughs> yes. Yes. yes, shall we start? Koshik, do we have any other time? Or shall no, we so start? Let's, let's begin. Start. Yeah, shall, we shall start. Yeah. Let's start. So, Amadir Atkir Bishesh Alojana. চক্র যে আজকে রাখা রয়েছে তাতে আমরা যে বিষয় শুনব মধ্যকালীন ভারতের সমাজ ও সংস্কৃতির অনুধাবন আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ডিং মিডিয়াবল ইন্ডিয়ান সোসাইটি এন্ড কালচার আমরা একটা রিভিজিট করতে চলেছি প্রফেসর হারবন্স মুখিয়ার সঙ্গে আমরা হয়তো সকলেই এখানে যারা শ্রোতা বন্ধুরা রয়েছেন যারা ইতিহাস প্রেমীরা রয়েছেন তারা হয়তো সবাই মধ্যকালীন ভারতের সমাজ সংস্কৃতির ধারণা তৈরি করেছেন নানাভাবে কিন্তু এক্ষুনি যে কথাটা বললেন প্রফেসর মুখিয়া যে তার দীর্ঘদিনের যে অভিজ্ঞতা তার পক্ক কেশ তার সেই পক্ক কেশের যে অভিজ্ঞতায় যে যে আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ডিং এর অভিজ্ঞতার সেই দামটা আজকে আমরা বুঝতে পারবো এবং আমাদেরকে তিনি সেই ভাবে আবার ফিরে দেখাবেন নতুন করে কিছু দেখাবেন এই আশা নিয়ে আমি অনুরোধ করছি প্রফেসর মুখিয়াকে স্যার প্লিজ স্টার্ট থ্যাংক ইউ থ্যাংক ইউ ভেরি মাচ ফর ইনভাইটিং মি ইটস গ্রেট টু ইন্টারাক্ট হ্যাভিং রিটায়ার্ড ফ্রম টিচিং আই থিঙ্ক ইন সেভেন ইয়ার্স আগো ইটস গ্রেট টু ইন্টারাক্ট উইথ ফ্রেন্ডস 
now with this new technology one can sit at home and interact with the friends who are also sitting in their homes and uh, speak to them and listen to them and interact with them this is always a very uh, refreshing exercise to be able to uh, to be able to speak and interact with friends uh, across across the country almost you know. uh, well i would be speaking on this uh, theme understanding medieval indian society and uh, culture which as you can see is a very vast theme uh, and since it's a vast theme uh, i'll be uh, making long strides in this uh, not going into many details but you know uh, a kind of uh, uh, forming an outline of 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 the theme rather than a uh, very detailed kind of studies we won't have the time for the detailed study and the second element of this uh, theme is that as you can see uh, all of these terms understanding medieval indian society culture all of these are what shall i say ambivalent terms ambiguous terms there there is no certitude there is no certainty certitude about definitiveness about any of these terms you know understanding itself cannot be definitive you know it, it's always subject to modification subject to alteration and so on uh, medieval itself is 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 uh, is, is is a concept which is open to discussion and so on so forth culture society all of these are ambivalent terms they are not they don't have a fixed meaning and therefore uh, i'll be trying to explore some of the ambivalence of these uh, of uh, ambivalence of these uh, and uh, the ambiguity of these and probably to some extent even certitude of this of these uh, of this thing now let me start with the term medieval uh medieval is a term as you know <coughs> given to us by europe uh it's a term which uh, by, was evolved in the context of the history of church in europe history of theolo history of theology and church in europe around the 16th century onwards but it was concretized in the towards the end of the 17th century uh, towards the towards the end of the 17th century uh, in 1688 sorry i keep getting calls in, in the middle uh, 1688 in in europe where this tripartite division of ancient medieval and modern came along now uh, the tripartite division had a meaning the meaning was that it had a it had a value load to it the value load to it was that while the term modern had been used earlier in the 5th century 6th century ad in europe but it was a descriptive term it was a term which was meant to demarcate the present from the past by the uh, post renaissance post reformation period in europe the term uh, the tripartite division came to acquire or the term modern came to acquire a certain meaning certain value and what was the value the value was uh, modern was something which was uh, which was attributed the value of uh, rationality modern was rational modern was scientific modern was progressive and since modern was scientific progressive rational and so on so forth it's it's uh, it's othering it's the other side it's the pre modern or what they called medieval was its other namely it's the irrational the reactionary the backward looking the static uh, the the uh, the the religious uh, uh, superstitious and so on so forth you know, in contrast to rationality so that uh, medieval came to acquire this uh, this attributes of uh, of backwardness irrationality superstition and so on and so forth It basically static uh, static and backward you know as comparison to modern now this was in the context of europe this tripartite division came in the context of europe but you know from the rest of the europe as europe expanded into the rest of the world Uh, with its arms and its trade and so on and so forth its intellectual concepts also expanded into the rest of the world and therefore 
gradually, while Europe remained modern and rational and progressive and so on, the rest of the world became medieval, uh, dark. Dark ages is the term they use for medieval. Dark, irrational, and so on and so forth. You know. So that uh, uh, the, 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 the term uh, medieval came to apply, and as, as I said, in terms of its uh, value load, in terms of uh, describing something which is irrational, which is backward, which is static, and so on and so forth, it came to describe the rest of the world in comparison in comparison to Europe, which was rational, progressive, and scientific, and so on and so forth. You know. So India also was part of that medieval world uh, until Europe came and liberate, liberated uh, the rest of the world and brought it into the modern period. Now, so that medieval has this notion of uh, dark, static, backward, and so on and so forth, you know, uh, uh, embedded in it. You can't get away from this. You know, however, you might uh, expand or or uh, qualify the term medieval. You can't get away from these attributes to it, uh, which is which is uh, we, you you can't divorce the term medieval from its association with modern. You know, medieval is uh, is unmodern. Medieval is what is not modern, and modern is rational and so on and so forth. So the term medieval uh, uh, give, gives to us gives to us this notion of being backward and static and so on and so forth, irrational and so on and so forth. In India, of course, that uh, the this tripartite division came in a different form. It came with James Mill in the form of Hindu, Muslim, and British period. But the essential ingredients were the same. You know, it came because uh, the history then was history of dynasties and so on and so forth. So the Hindu period is when the Hindus were ruling, Muslim period is when the Muslim dynasties were ruling, and then came the British, which brought modernity to the to India. You know, so uh, it came, but the, the 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 terminology changed in 1903 for the first time. The term ancient, medieval, and modern is used. Uh, in a book of Stanley Lane Poole, A History of Mohammedan India. Uh, he, he uses it for the first time, but if the term is new, but the, the basis of the terminology is the same, uh, Hindu and Muslim and British period, which continued right until the, until the 1950s, actually, in the study of history. Now, so medieval uh, has come to us with a loaded meaning of backward, static, irrational, and so on and so forth. Let us then come to India. Was really was India <coughs> really backward, static, uh, irrational, backward looking uh, in medieval times or in the centuries that are denoted to us as that was given to us as that as that we understand as medieval? Was it really backward? Let's look at the some of the aspects of medieval Indian uh, history and society and culture and see and economy. And see if if it was it fits into this category of medieval as uh, unmodern as backward and so on and so forth. Uh, let me also say that uh, uh, that the the term medieval kept changing its uh, its boundaries, temporal boundaries, uh, until about the 1950s, mid 50s, or even late 50s. Uh, the term medieval coincided with the same uh, uh, division that James Mill had given Hindu period, uh, Muslim period, and British period. So the medieval was mid, uh, Muslim period of Indian history. Uh, but that's because history then that, that was studied was history of dynasties and so on and so forth. And, uh, and the defining feature of these, defining, defining element of these was the religion of the ruling dynasty. You know? So Hindu period, Muslim period, British period, uh, and very clearly divided until about the eighth century, seven, uh, until about uh, seven, 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 seventh century, eighth century, Harsha, post Harsha period, it was Hindu period. Then uh, Muslim period began either with Mahmud of Ghazni's invasion or the establishment of Delhi Sultanate in 1707 with Aurangzeb's death, medieval period ended. Uh, and modern period began in 1765 with Diwani. So, you know, uh, 
and lots of in, uh, no man's land, as it were, in, in the early as well as the later period, was left untouched. Uh, so that uh, uh, the medieval period had these very strict boundaries, you know, uh, from this year to this year, from this year to this year. These were the medieval period. But that's because history was studied in terms of dynasties and so on and so forth. But then history began to change. And uh, new kinds of approaches, new kinds of uh, concepts, new kinds of perspectives began to develop, particularly social and economic perspectives. Perspectives of social economic history began to develop where these strict chronologies of this year, 1707, uh, 1708, modern, well, modern period begins 1765, but 1707, the medieval period ends, you know, and it began in 1206, or maybe 1000 AD or 1206. You know. So that kind of very tightly drawn uh, temporal boundary gave way, because socioeconomic history is not bound by this on the, in this year society in the year 1206 the society was like, like this in the year 1207 society became like this and in the year 1707 it was culture was this in a year 1708 became like this so socio economic cultural history is not bound by these strict uh, chronological divides or particularly in the in terms of years and so on so forth you know. this take in large swathes of time and of course space so that history writing began to change and therefore the time brackets began to change and we we got the concept of early medieval india which was preceded uh, what was officially for, formally known as medieval india so early medieval india came along uh, sometime in the 1960s particularly it was it was used by several historians but particularly with the work of Professor Aresh Sharma, uh, who gave us uh, the concept of uh, feudalism uh, in this early medieval period. Now, uh, I'm not going to the discussion of feudalism uh, mercifully, but you know, uh, this notion of feudalism as a one of or notion of early medieval India, which coincides with feudalism. Gave us a one-off kind of, you know, uh, one-off one -off period standing by itself, you know, which is, uh, uh, which doesn't, which doesn't connect with the so-called medieval period per se. Uh, it stands by itself. And it stands by itself with when the, uh, when uh, urban centers decline, uh, 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 money in circulation decline, trade decline, and ruralization, in, uh, insularization of economy, economy take, they took place just as it had happened in Europe, or it was supposed to have happened in Europe, according to Henri Perrin. So uh, you have a period of virtual decline, uh, virtual decline of uh, uh, economy and therefore uh, uh, social uh, tensions and so on, so forth. social tensions arose, and uh, so you have a one one off period of decline, uh, economic economic decline, and other forms of decline, uh, which, by the way, is also in a way coincides with the notion of uh, <laughs> medieval as the period of decline, period of uh, dark age, uh, which is propagated in India uh, very widely is also in a way a reflection of European notion of mid dark ages in, in, in Europe itself. But anyway, uh, uh, let's go back to uh, early medieval period. Now, early medieval period uh, as a period of uh, decline of trade, urbanization, and so on, so forth, general decline. Really, is that really so? Let me also, uh, let me also, it's not only Professor Arash Sharma, but you know, the classic uh, book we have, uh, economic history of uh, India in two volumes. Uh, one is first volume, 1200 to 1200 to I think 1750, and the other is uh, by, uh, edited by two frontline historians, front-ranking historians of India, Tapan Rai Chaudhary and Irfan Habib, and the second volume by Dharma Kumar. Now, in the first volume, uh, it begins to 1200. 
but it also uh, notes that in its uh, introduction that we are, we are beginning with 1200 because uh, there wasn't much happening prior to 1200. You know? So uh, 1200, in a way, or the establishment of Delhi Sultanate is a kind of uh, marks the uh, marks the uh, you know beginning of change in society or or development in society, economic development in society. Prior to that, there wasn't much of much to speak of. Is it really so? Uh, but let me say that Professor Irfan Habib did alter his opinion later on and did take in, uh, he did recognize that early medieval period was not as uh, unchanging or as static as he had probably had assumed earlier in the introduction to this volume. But, you know, in that volume itself, it does make the statement that nothing much happened prior to 1200. So that, uh, uh, is it really so? Is is that really so that nothing much happened uh, before in the early medieval period, that it was a period of great stasis? No, it wasn't. Some of the most, uh, some of the most significant Technological development, economic developments were taking place, social developments were taking place in this period of early medieval India. Oh my God! Uh, in this period of early medieval India, I mean, some some of these technological devices were with us until, in certainly in my my uh, childhood, uh, even when I was young, probably I'm sure. Many of you must have even seen these, like uh, some of the irrigation devices, for example. You know, the water wheels, uh, three kinds of water wheels. Uh, Persian wheel is the latest of these three kinds of water wheels, which immensely, greatly expanded agriculture. Various other kinds of irrigation devices developed in this period. The uh, oil press developed in this period, and it's interestingly, Still, uh, 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 sarso oil uh, is still being sold under the under the you know, uh, Sorry, sorry. I had to. This call was coming again and again. I had to. Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, oil. Yeah, <laughs> this. Uh, uh, mustard oil is still under, is still sold under the title of Kachi Ghani. You know, <laughs> Kachi Ghani is really is the product of early medieval India. This technology is a product of early medieval India, uh, and we still prefer uh, uh, this Kachi Ghani Katil uh, whenever we can get hold of it. Or uh, oil, or or uh, cotton press pressing, pressing, pressing uh, cotton seeds from the from the uh, cotton and 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 so on and so forth, you know. So uh, uh, so new kinds of technologies which had uh, and great expansion of irrigation irrigation uh, facilities at the local level. I'm not talking of uh, big uh, dams and uh, Sudarshan Lake and which is important, you know, and and uh, and uh, irrigation canals later on, uh, which are important. But I'm talking of local level individual initiative of peasants themselves, small peasants, not so small peasants, big peasants, big farmers. They are in taking the initiative uh, to uh, dig up a small hole of a well, for example, you know, kacha well, for example, or a pakka well, for example, which are very few in number. Uh, and of course, these devices, uh, water wheel devices, and so on and so forth. You know. So the as a result, a great expansion of agriculture is taking place. Enormous expansion of agriculture is taking place. Uh, uh, and this expansion is taking place through social energy. It's not taking place, uh, it's, I mean, it's also taking place through the energy unleashed by the state and the directive of the state. But uh, as important or probably much more important is the Social initiative, initiative at the level of the peasant, individual peasants, uh, uh, and groups of peasants that is taking place. That energy, that enormous energy, is leaving a great impact, great, great change 
in economy, in agricultural expansion, in the expansion of crafts, uh, and in the and therefore generating of resources. The kinds of new crops that are being grown all the time, new ever new crops. And new varieties of old 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 crops you know, that are being experimented with, experimented with, and growing growing all the time. So that you know, let us try to uh, understand and appreciate the social energy which is involved uh, in the expansion of economy in the early medieval period. And that is when the state virtually doesn't exist. You know, in this period, certainly doesn't exist. Later on, in the medieval period, uh, state does come in and digs canals and so on and so forth. You know, but in the early mid, so that uh, the expansion of energy, expansion of sorry, agriculture or expansion of economy or uh, the unleashing of social energy is not uh, dependent upon the state initiative. It is independent of the state initiative. Similarly, in the 15th century, there is a great deal of uh, new urban centers coming into being when the state is virtually absent there. So we, we have to, uh, we, we, are, we are not saying that the state and society are in opposition to each other there, but we are saying that uh, uh, we have so far emphasized the state initiative in, uh, uh, in uh, expanding economy and so on and so forth. Uh, but we have to appreciate the uh, local initiative, individual initiative at the social level, social initiative, social energy in expanding uh, the economy and uh, in overall economy and, at, and its impact on, on society. So that I'm suggesting, therefore, that economically, technologically and economically in terms of expansion of agriculture and crafts and so on and so forth, uh, is, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a phenomenon which is, which is uh, characteristic of early medieval India and goes on, in fact, even earlier, but characteristic of early medieval India and goes on into the medieval period. The medieval period is uh, through these efforts and through the state effort in this case in particular, a highly centralized state, which also undertakes uh, not only irrigation canals and so on, but seeks to extend agriculture to grants and so on and so forth, you know. So that, you know, it's an ever-expanding economy. Uh, ever-expanding economy, so much so that, you know, by the, by the 18th century, uh, India becomes a sinosaur of, uh, of the whole world for its riches, for its... Uh, and we know by now that by the mid of the 18th century, India commanded something like 24 to 25 percent of the world's GDP, a quarter of the world's GDP. And all along with China, it commanded, the two regions commanded something like a half of the world's GDP. Such were the riches, uh, that uh, such was the prosperity that uh, marked the early medieval and medieval period, far from being static, far from being uh, uh, backward looking, far from, from being uh, poverty stricken, stricken we are told again and again that you know ancient ancient period was a period of great toning uh, kichiriya and it all declined in the medieval period actually in the medieval period uh, by the 18th century india was uh, if not the, the richest certainly the second richest country in the world and as i said sanusur of the world you know. uh, so that uh, it's far from the picture that we keep getting uh, Second aspect, uh, it's a economic uh, expansion always leads to uh, greater and greater uh, dip differentiation, uh, economic differentiation and therefore social differentiation. Uh, you know, the, the notion of uh, uh, rich getting richer and uh, poor getting poor. Uh, or rich getting richer and poor getting poorer in absolute term it's a very uh, it's not a very definitive notion you know it doesn't really happen that you know uh, the rich are get if you, if a rich has a resource of 100 let's say uh, and uh, and uh, uh, is getting richer 
and raises it to makes it to 200 and the poor who has a getting a who is who has a resource of 10 uh, is becoming poorer and his, his resource is reduced to five this is not how things happen how things happen is with economic with with uh, agriculture or any other kind of economic progress things happen is that those who are rich they become much richer and those who are poor are at the lower end of society they also add, add to their resources but the addition to their resources is of a much lower scale on a much lower scale than the addition at the higher level so that the rich are certainly becoming richer but the poor poor are also adding to their resources but the differentiation between them is becoming sharper and sharper we can see that it before our eyes the differentiation is becoming sharper this is what has happened throughout history this is what has happened everywhere in history with with the uh, with expansion uh, differentiation uh, the whole society benefit but uh, benefits benefits unequally differentially higher levels different, uh, benefiting far more than the lower levels of society so that we have a uh, highly stratified rural society highly stratified rural society economically and of course caste also but come to that in a moment economically highly stratified society let me state here that until once again until the 1950s uh, it was assumed that you know there were no classes uh, in india uh, it was all the, everybody was sort of equal uh, or equally poor if you like uh, there was no differentiation there was no stratification uh, uh, most european observers had this observation about india uh, and uh, marx also had the same observation you know the notion of uh, notion of uh, absence of class and so on and so forth and therefore absence of history and uh, therefore absence of class struggle and absence of history and so on we are quite familiar with that uh, my guru dr k m ashraf was a great communist himself uh, used to teach us in class same thing there were no classes and therefore there were no there was no uh, class struggles and so on. this is 19 early 1950s mid 50s since then, things changed radically, as perceptions have changed radically. Particularly, Irfan Habib was the one who brought in the question of highly stratified rural society in medieval India. Very highly stratified. Not only that the rich are very rich and the poor are poor, but in between also there is not one layer, but many, many layers in between the rich and the poor. So it's a very highly stratified society, uh, economically highly stratified society and therefore the level of burden on this highly stratified, highly stratified society that the state places is also uh, highly stratified uh, but uh, all add to this is the question of caste caste stratification uh, caste step stratification is not a product of medieval india caste stratification is much older uh, but this caste stratification also becomes more uh, complex uh, with this economic stratification. So that caste stratification, economic strat stratification, and a new element, the denominational stratification with the coming of Islam, they add to the great complexity of medieval society in many, many different, in economic ways, in 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 in, in uh, socially culturally in terms of religion and so on and so forth so it's a becomes a highly uh, complex society not that it was simpler uh, simple simplistic earlier but it becomes far more complex increasingly with these new elements ad adding to the complexity now uh, so that one could say that the early medieval centuries in india were a melting pot as it were you know uh, economically, socially, culturally, and even even politically, it was a kind of uh, multi multi uh, melting pot. With uh, politically, with new alien uh, groups having come and conquered and established themselves as rulers and subdued the existing ruling groups, 
uh, and therefore establishing and thereafter establishing a kind of highly centralized administrative control, which wasn't uh, the case immediately earlier. So that a very, very different kind of uh, uh, picture is emerging in the, in the medieval period. Uh, two profound, the, uh, two profound uh, cultural, uh, uh, cultural, uh, what shall I say, cultural changes are taking place. Cultural outcomes of this melting pot is taking place. Uh, well, well, these were, one is the rise of uh, many regional languages. Uh, most of what we call vernaculars, most of these vernaculars are the product of medieval period. Uh, upwards of nor nor north of Bindhyas, uh, the Dravidian language is a different group and is not. Most of these are uh, most of these are changes, which are uh, cultural changes that I'm talking of. Languages uh, are occurring north of the Vindhyas in North Indian, from from west to, to east. Uh, these these languages are emerging. These uh, vernaculars are emerging uh, in the medieval period. Uh, and the uh, and the uh, second is that there is a growing element of protest popular protest against control over the minds and behavior of people. Now, these are very interesting, appear to me to be very interesting phenomena. Uh, pheno interesting phenomenon in the sense that on one hand, we have... Uh, on one hand, we have a, a high degree of control, certainly administrative control, but even control over the resources, economic resources, through uh, distribution of resources, unequal distribution of resources, social control through caste system, and so on and so forth. Uh, and now, uh, even religious control, in a way, through the introduction of uh, denomination, denominational religions. Uh, so that we are in a very highly controlled scenario, and in this highly controlled, centralized control scenario at all levels, there is this, what shall I call, uh, I'm hesitating to use the word, uh, but I can't think of any other word. There is a kind of democratization process taking place. The emergence of languages, emergence of vernaculars is a democratization process. It's a process which enlarges the participation of people uh, with each other, interact with each other, listen to each other, speak to each other on a much larger scale. You know? uh, so there is a, there, it is a kind of democratization process. Uh, and the second one is an even more democratization process where uh, through the democratization of God as, uh, as uh, a very personal God, God who doesn't reside necessarily in temples and, and uh, mosques and so on and so forth, is very personal to you, personal to each one of us. So that there is a kind of democratization of God, and therefore there is a kind of uh, uh, rebellion uh, against uh, centralized control, either uh, uh, not economic control so much as cultural control, uh, either through caste or through religion, uh, our religious rituals and so on and so forth. So it's a very interesting paradox that one can see. Paradox of, on one hand, centralization of control. On the other hand, a kind of uh, kind of protest against this, kind of democratization, if you like, kind of protest against this uh, centralization of control. And Bhakti movement is obviously the most important uh, expression of this protest that we are talking of. Uh, uh, now, the, I think the, uh, I would particularly like, like to mention one figure in this in this uh, 
in both these question of language and the question of uh, democratization uh, process and that that is kabir kabir particularly uh, is a very significant i mean there are all of these great saints uh, which have uh, bhakti saints which have uh, uh, which have shaped this protest but kabir really stands out kabir stands out because he is not merely protesting against uh, caste which he is he is not merely protesting against uh, rituals religious rituals which he is you know making fun of uh, mullahs and pandits and uh, namaz and so on so forth but and puja and so on but he is giving us a new concept altogether a fantastic fabulous uh, new concept altogether what is the new concept that he is you know when islam comes to india islam and hinduism they are totally uh, what what shall i say not not only different but opposed to one another in terms of their concept of god in terms of the concept of worship of god in everything they stand face to face against each other with each other uh, so the in one the concept of god is singular god one single god la ilaha illallah there is only one god there is only one allah there, is, there are no gods and in the other there are hundreds and thousands of gods and goddesses in one the notion of uh, 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 the, the 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 ritual of uh, prayers is only one namaz in the other the prayers can be said in th- said in thousands of ways and so on so forth so everything is different and therefore the social implications of this the among the uh, among the followers of these religions the social divisions among these followers of re- these religions are also very different hindus and muslims uh, follow different kinds of social norms as well uh, not i'm not saying opposite but different uh, norms uh, now therefore naturally there would be there would be bit of give and take in this there was a lot of give and take uh, between the sufis and uh, the uh, nath panthis particularly uh, of which goraknath uh, <laughs> mat is a particular uh, shining example uh, in its history not in its present but uh, uh, it's in its present is a its present is a great distortion of its history but a uh, uh, lot of give and take uh, at the idea at the level of ideas at the level of rituals at the level of many practices and so on so forth but there is also a great deal of tension with, between two uh, uh, diametrically opposite concepts of god and uh, diamet- diametrically opposite concepts of forms of worship and so on so forth and and social organization following that now what kabir does is in in la ilaha illallah there is no god except there is no god except allah this is known as tawhid uh, 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 that's to say uh, one god you know the notion of one god uh, monotheism now uh, tawhid uh, has been interpreted very very differently within islam but uh, within the framework of islam nobody has questioned the islamic framework in which if tawhid the meaning of tawhid occurs the meaning of tawhid is very very differently interpreted but within the framework of islam what kabir does is he is no philosopher but he is great he he greatly invents a philosophy greatly uh, what shall i say establishes a sort propagates a philosophy enunciates a philosophy which has which is still living with us and the philosophy is that in the you know in this hindu and muslim notions of god and rituals and so on so forth gods are posited as rivals as competitors as opposite to each other my god and my god my allah and your ishwar you know, they are opposite each other they are competing with it kabir formulates the notion of one universal god and one universal uh, religiosity uh, what he is doing is 
he is not only uh, eliminating the competition between ishwar and allah but he is also uh, also positing a different counterposition a different kind of dichotomy the dichotomy between two religions hinduism and islam is replaced by another dichotomy totally a different dichotomy namely between religiosity universal religiosity or universal god on one hand universal religiosity on one hand and denominational religious religions on the other hand you know this is the dichotomy he is positing in the concept of one universal god who is god for everyone so that uh, as a result of this uh, this uh, concept of uh, one universal relig religiosity rather than two different religions he is really greatly dissolving the tensions that would arise between religious denominational religious uh, religions coming to coming uh, coming to each other and coming and confronting each other so that kabir particularly is not only uh, demolishing the notion of caste hierarchy but he is also demolishing the notion of your religion my religion is superior to yours and and so on and so forth and therefore it must prevail he is he is demolishing that concept and therefore it has a great deal of uh, as i said it still a living we still uh, talk of uh, uh, god is one there are different ways of approaching that is the kabirian philosophy uh, well not philosophy but kabirian ethos if you like so that uh, uh, so that it's a very very uh, as 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 the point i'm emphasizing i emphasized earlier in the e economic sphere the great energy social energy unleashing itself uh, in the economic sphere i'm repeating the same point replicating the same point in the social and cultural sphere particularly the cultural sphere religious cultural sphere namely that great energy of uh, bhakti saint in particular in kabir is rep, is re releasing itself to uh, to uh, to lessen to diminish social tensions which would arise from two religions uh, standing in opposition to each other so it's a it's a very dynamic period very very dynamic period uh, now uh, let me say that uh, this uh, and of course caste caste uh, caste of course uh, is under attack let me say that uh, 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 bhakti movement is an egalitarian ideology surely uh, but you know uh, one problem with egalitarian ideology is ideologies is that they propagate egalitarianism but they never are able to establish egalitarian society no egalitarian ideology has ever been able to establish a egalitarian society and we have had many such egalitarian ideologies uh, uh, christianity is an egalitarian ideology islam is an egalitarian ideology uh, sikhism is an egalitarian ideology and outside of religions marxism is a greatly egalitarian ideology but none of these was ever able to establish egalitarian society so what does the egalitarian ideology do it shakes up the structure the the existing structure existing hierarchical structure <clears throat> and uh, by shaking up the existing hierarchical structure it sort of it sort of uh, you know uh, allows the lower elements uh, elements at the lower end of society to move upwards a little bit and create new hierarchies you know where they are somewhat more favorably placed than they were earlier so this is what uh, I, uh, egalitarian ideologies do in society this is what they did in medieval india this is what bhakti movement did uh, in medieval india it didn't establish it didn't abolish caste but uh, created sort of a bit of mobility bit of leeway and uh, a bit of culture if you like bit of mobility within the caste system uh, 
Now, we are fully aware that uh, this was a highly uh, <coughs> patriarchal society. Patriarchy was necessarily, uh, necessarily prevalent, uh, pervasive, in fact. Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, and women naturally are, the, are, are at the receiving end of this patriarchy, naturally. That's the meaning of patriarchy. Uh, power, therefore, uh, is, is, is rests entirely with men, and women, therefore, are uh, devoid of power. Now, I, uh, having considered the notion of patriarchy, which is a, which is hardly any concession, which is a fact of history, all over, and not only in India, not only in this period, all throughout history, human history, that is a fact. Yes, but I would like to suggest that you know. Within a structure, uh, power is power is power is seen. It has been seen as a possession. Uh, so one side possesses power, one party possesses power, the other is devoid of power. In patriarchy, men possess power, women are devoid devoid of power. Men possess resources, women are devoid of resources. So that's the meaning of. Uh, uh, this power structure. That's how we understood it. Is it really so? Uh, I would suggest that we look at the notion of power uh, slightly differently. We look at power uh, as a relation rather than as a possession. That is to say, every power, every kind of power is a shared power. Unequally shared. Very, very unequally shared but nonetheless shared, so that in every structure, whether it is patriarchy or it is political structure or it is any kind, any cultural structure or whatever, uh, social structure, in any, in any structure, power is shared between two sides or more than two sides, any number of sides. Power is shared unequally, very unequally, but nonetheless shared, so that both sides have some at the higher end, they have great power. At the lower end, they also have some power, and they can create, they can enlarge the space of power to some extent. They can't overthrow the structure of power, but they can enlarge their space by, by through various means. You know, through their uh, women, for example, have the power of cuisine in their hand, the kitchen in their hand. You know. The women have the power of uh, of uh, rearing their children, uh, uh, which which is also uh, which is also which also make children, uh, you know, uh, very well. I wouldn't say obedient, subservient, but certainly very res respectful to their mothers and grandmothers. Uh, women also have uh, the management of household, uh, uh, the household e household economy, uh, household budget. And so on and so forth. They also uh, have, uh, the, have have the power of sexuality in their in their, in their uh, for, with them, so that women also have some power, you know, and which power can be it's constantly expanded or dim, diminished according to each circumstance. So that power is a kind of relation. You know. Every everywhere there is you know power between uh, father and children. Power relation between father and children unequal. Nonetheless, children have power. You know, some power which they even small children when they cry aloud and want something, you know, the father would ultimately say, "Okay, okay, keep quiet. I'll give it to you." When the children grow up, they have their own power. They, 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 they are they are not uh, dictated to always. They they create their own spaces. You know, uh, uh, between institutions and the employees, employer and the employee, there is there is a distribution of power, unequal distribution of power the, between the lord and the serf, lord and the peasant. There is an unequal unequal distribution distribution of power. But even the peasant has the power of control over the over the production process. And one of the most uh, interesting manifestations of this power of control by the peasants is their lethargy become very lethargic when they are cultivating the Lord's land and they become very energetic when they are controlling, when they are uh, sorry, cultivating their own land. Don't 
all the employers always complain oh this fellow is so lethargic so insolent so indolent and so on so forth you know uh, that is their that is also their power i'm not saying they 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 realize that this is power and they are deliberately constructing upon that power but this is this is intuitively this is how power works you know to a kind of shared kind of balance which balance which keeps changing all the time you know depends in depending on which what circumstances so i would suggest that you know women also are are under a patriarch patriarchal dominance for for sure you know? but certainly they are not powerless completely nobody is com completely powerless even a beggar has the power to make you to make you feel guilty of your resources and therefore you hand over some of it to him so that power is a kind of relation rather than uh, entirely a position on one side the other side being so that uh, i would suggest that women also create spaces for themselves within the household uh, within the society within the community uh, at the higher level with the ruling class they have power they exercise power uh, uh, un 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 uh, Uh, unequal power sure but nonetheless some power which they have which they have the capacity to uh, en enhance uh, in 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 certain circumstances if they are if they if they if they if they can uh, use those circumstances so that uh, uh, so that uh, yeah that is the given structure patriarchy is the given structure women are at the uh, are the uh, are the victims of this and yet uh, women also have some power which they are able to use in their daily life in their community life their social life and so on and so forth uh and uh finally let me uh, let me say that you know uh, there is uh, uh, there is uh, adjustment as it were at every level uh, at the level of administration at the level of court at the level of culture at the level of religion there is tension as well as cohesion there is uh, asim there is competition as well as uh, cohesion uh, as well as assimilation from each other you know? like in a family it's like in a family uh, family there is competition as well as cohesion competition as well as uh, almost a uh, daily kind of adjustment and uh, and assimilation and so on so forth so it's a it's a it's a society it's a it's a it's a society where uh, uh which is very dynamic in every sense let me let me conclude with uh, with one uh, uh, particularly significant uh, uh, aspect namely the uh, exchange of ideas one uh, had assumed uh, until now until very recently that you know the ruling class uh, dominates not only administratively and politically and and so on so forth but it also dominates society through uh, ideology through culture so there is an ideological and cultural domination of society so ideas and culture and ideology flows from the top to the bottom uh, this is what sociologists tell us the concept of sanskritization is that this is what uh, uh, statements like uh, in any uh, epoch the ruling ideology is the ideology of the ruling class that it's the same notion of uh, ideas flowing from the top to the bottom and dominating the bottom but let me give you uh, two uh, examples from medieval india you know where you know akbar's reign is particularly famous for among other things for his, and uh, akbar and uh, his uh, uh, intellectual companion abul fazl are famous for postulating the notion of sulh kul universal peace or absolute peace peace with all which is very 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 dramatic departure from the notion of an islamic state 
is not an Islamic state. It's a state which establishes peace with all. Because any theocratic state will seek to dominate those who don't belong to that religion. Uh, subjugate, dominate those who belong to that religion. The notion of Sulaikul is the opposite of that. There is no domination of any group by any other group for reasons of for uh, reasons of religious identity or 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 any other idea. So that Sulaikul is a fantastically innovative idea uh, given to us by Abu Fazl and uh, Akbar. But you know the basic notion of Sulaikul is actually Kabir's notion. Kabir's notion that I just mentioned. Kabir's notion of universal religiosity, not not one religion, not Islam, but universal religiosity. Uh, they were not atheists. They believed in God, but a God which was not an Islamic God or a Hindu God or a denominational God, but one God for all. The same notion that Kabir uh, had propounded, the notion of uh, one one universal religiosity and one universal God. That's the basic idea of Sulaikul. That's the source of the idea of Sulaikul. So here is a case where the topmost intellectual, imperial intellectual at the imperial court is uh, is uh, is uh, obtaining, resourcing his idea, obtaining his idea, picking up his idea, basic idea from a ground level weaver called Kabir. So that uh, there is an uh, there is an there is an upward and a downward mobility of ideas. It's not a single single track mobility from up from top to down. It's a it's a it's a upward and downward mobility of ideas. Or similarly, folklore. So many folklore practices which are practiced in the village. When when somebody falls sick, you go to the doctor. But you also start distributing charity <laughs> as a kind of, you know, bring relief to uh, God will bring the poor. The, the uh, prayers of the poor people will bring relief. Uh, this is this is what is happened. This is what happens in, in the village. This is what is happening at the imperial court. Uh, uh, the Jahan Ara Shah Jahan's daughter is burns her hand. And uh, among other things, Doctors and Hakims and so on, lots of charities distributed so that she gets cured. It's a folkloric practice that is being adopted at the at the imperial level. So that uh, and so on and so forth. You know, one can one can go on. So that uh, or let me give one 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 final example. You know, uh, the uh, the uh, Babur's and Humayun's and Akbar's daughters are getting married all the time. Babur's uh, daughters and sisters getting married once, twice, even thrice uh, after divorce or after the death of their husband, they get uh, married again. And he casually mentioned this. But you know, Shah Jahan's daughters, Jahan and Jahan, Roshan Rara, can't get married. Why can't they get married? Who can be more eligible uh, bridegroom, bride, sorry, than Shah, Jahan, Shah Jahan's own daughter? They can't get married because there is an imbibing of popular Hindu culture where, you know, the bride giving family and bride taking family, they are hierarchical place, hierarchically placed. They are not they are not at par. The bride giving family is at a lower level than the bride taking family. Not economically or socially or politically, but in terms of culture. Culture, that is the culture, you know. The bride taking family has also always to be humble and submissive and so on and so forth because the bride giving bride sorry bride giving family has to be humble and submissive and so on to the bride taking family and so on. And so forth. Now this is a culture which has which has uh, you know seeped into the imperial family so that who can be superior to Shah Jahan's own family? Where can you find a bride bridegroom? Bridegroom who, who is superior to Shah Jahan's family, so they they they, they can't get uh, a bridegroom who is superior to, and they can't marry uh, somebody who is inferior to uh, Shah Jahan because the inferiority has to go with the bride, not with the bridegroom. Social inferiority, cultural inferiority, 
or supposed to be cultural affair. So that they can't get married. They have lots of affairs. That's different, but they can't get married. So there is a popular cultural uh, uh, cultural seepage into the imperial family where they are adopting norms, mores and norms from from the from the subject from their own subject. So this is happening all the time. This happens in all societies. So let me now con conclude by saying that uh, uh, one that uh, society had uh, observed differences, various kinds of differences, but these are not uh, particularly religious differences, but even other differences. But these are not turned into antagonisms. This is that is you can understand this in the present day context when differences are being turned into antagonisms, act actively turned into antagonism. This is what was not happening. So that when we talk of medieval Indian society or Indian society as a whole as immensely diverse, the diversity is recognition of differences and respect for differences, but without letting them turn into antagonisms. This is what medieval society was. It, it, it recognized differences, uh, respected differences, but did not let them turn into antagonism. And this is one reason why I think uh, it's interesting that in the 550 years of the so-called Muslim rule in India, there is not a single communal riot that we understand today, that occurs 500 times every year today you know, under the ages of secular state. There was no, there is no record of communal rioting in uh, in medieval India, in the whole of medieval India, until 1714, seven, year, seven years after Aurangzeb's death. There's one riot takes place, the first riot takes place. At least we get the first in record of riot takes place, 1714 in Ahmedabad. Uh, after that, in the 18th century, there are five or six riots, uh, communal riots, uh, but that's about all. But that's because they, the society was respected that diversity, uh, the cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism of, uh, of court, uh, which, which patronized Persian language and literature, also Sanskrit language and literature, also particularly Braj. Uh, language and literature was the favorite of most of these Mughal uh, uh, poets. Mughal kings were actually poets. They wrote Hindi poetry in Braj Bhasha. Manager Pandya has published a book uh, called Mughal uh, Bhasha Ki Hindi Kavita. So that uh, they patronized all these. Patronized Persian much more. No, not equally patronized. Certainly unequal patronage. But nonetheless patronized all these. So that Cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism of uh, the court and uh, diversity at the social level. This is what uh, was uh, and and great dynamism, economic and social and cultural dynamism. This is what characterized medieval Indian society and culture, and this is what is under so much of threat today. Very organized, planned threat today. Thank you very much uh, for listening to me for for, for so long. Uh, I hope you have some questions. It was an excellent discussion, sir. I must. Uh, say uh, Professor Uttara Chakraborty Uttara Di, apni jodi kichu question abong alochona di shuru korin, amra ekhe ekhe tar kore, bhihinna question alochona nebe. Uttara Di, you are on mute. You have to unmute yourself. Yes. Hmm. yes. Uh? Now it's better. We can hear. She is again muted. No? Now it's better. Is it all right? Yes. Yes. I, I was wondering the way you have dealt with the entire medieval period. 
um, from the earliest time, from the 6th, 7th, 8th uh, centuries to the 18th. Um, I was wondering at this and uh, at the broad um, overviewing, uh, but not uh, missing out the details. You have mentioned the details as well. Well, I was, uh, I have a question. Uh, it's about uh, uh, the early medieval yeah. period, you yeah. know, the 8th century. Uh. I have often uh, wondered at this, that whether the Indian uh, scene in the 18th century, whether, you know, the men, you mentioned about uh, decline of urbanism and uh, decline of trade and uh, the not, uh, you know, the stopping of uh, circulation of coins. Uh, all these characteristics are uh, these borrowed from the West because we know uh, medieval Europe, Western Europe in the 8th, 9th centuries had all these characteristics. <laughs> So uh, that was uh, what I was thinking about. Uh, and secondly, uh, it's about the technological devices yeah. you mentioned uh, that developed in spite of the fact that there was a setback, there was a decline, yet there were many technological devices uh, that uh, developed during this time, the expansion of agriculture. The same with medieval Europe uh, when uh, this... Um, the three field system uh, was introduced, the rotation of the system of rotation crops, and all that. So there is yeah. a similarity. And uh, I was also thinking of a book. Uh, it's a story, it's a novel by Salman Rusti. It's called um, uh, Enchantments uh, 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 of Florence, where um, this particular man who had come from Florence claiming that he is related to the Mughals. And uh, he was telling us to attend Akbar's court and tell all sorts of stories. And then one day he said, there's a whisper going around in Europe uh, that it's not the sun which is going around the earth. It's yeah. the earth which is going around the sun. It's a whisper. We are not talking it yeah. uh, loudly. And Akbar patted his back and said, Uncle Mogul, we know all these things uh, for centuries. Yeah. <laughs> so... Um, I was reminded yeah. of that book. Um, and lastly, about woman power, you have said, um, uh, don't you think, I mean, I think, and I don't know, if I know um, that, that uh, woman has the power over the uh, kitchen and uh, uh, bringing up children, raising children. All these weren't they imposed uh -huh. upon them, imposed upon women that you stay home and you do these sorts of works. One thing I've noticed that uh, women in the lower, uh, from the lower classes in the villages, they are the ones who always go out to fetch water. Uh, Men do not uh, yes. do this. It's the women who go yes. out and fetch water. It's a heavy yes. burden yes. for them. So all these uh, questions that... Uh, yes. Rising in yes, thank you, Pradi. Uh, well, one, uh, you know, what you are saying about Europe, uh, you know, I think one notion that we historians have given up, given up long ago is the notion of uh, some some regions progressing very fast and others lying, you know, static. The notion of status, stat, stasis in society or history is a notion that historians have given up, given up long ago. That no society, no society at, at any time is a static society. It's always changing. Something or the other is always changing in every society. Now, pace of change would be different. Pace of change in a particular period of time would be different. The distribution of the results of change would be different. But nonetheless, all societies are changing. So yes, European society was changing. Uh, and European society uh, was, uh, though its, 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 uh, its productivity, etc., etc., was far lower than that of India, with agricultural productivity and three-fold three three field system gave it a seed yield ratio of one is to four. If you, if you, if you sow 10, 10 kilos of seed, you get 40 kilos of yield. 
in india uh, in the medieval in the 16 i think uh, slightly earlier uh, 16 maybe 15 century uh, the seed yield ratio is 1 is to 12 so uh, it's an enormously different kind of productivity of land and labor but nonetheless all societies are changing all economies are changing all the time so that one part of it you are you are right about uh, secondly uh, the 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 money in circulation contracting etc etc this is the not i mean this this notion also has been this was propagated in europe by only pirin in the 1920s and 30s which was abandoned very soon after that it somehow came to india in the 1960s professor aras sharma brought in the brought it along but you know that's a bd chatopadhyay had challenged it uh, earlier in fact dc sarkar had challenged on, not this notion but other notions of other aspects of feudalism uh, mf tarabdar of bangladesh historian he had challenged etc jail had challenged living without silver so all these notions have been challenged but i was just mentioning that these notions were propounded in the 1960s you know uh, i wasn't really either supporting or upholding or challenging them or just mentioning that these notions you know uh, uh, so they they have come from europe that's quite true as the last quest, last last point you are very well very important point that you are making you know i think uh, I, about women okay. i was i was not saying that women i mean again and again i was i was emphasizing unequal power uh, there is no equality there is no question of equality of power between the employer and the employee between the patriarch and the rest of the family between the man husband and the wife and so on there is no question of equality it's very highly unequal nonetheless i was just saying that you know women also have some power you know the the fact that uh, you 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 uh, you add uh, an, another spoonful of salt in the in, in your husband's uh, dishes three days and the fourth day he'll be on his knees and say please forgive me you know i i made a mistake okay. so uh, you know i'm i'm just saying that they have some power uh, it's not as if they are they are forced to they cook because they are forced to cook there's there's no other way you you mentioned that uh, rural women go and fetch water which is very true but rural women also go out and work on the fields uh, they also work on the fields. yeah uh, so they are working women in a way they are not uh, they are not so and if you work uh, you, you 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 the level of subjugation is far less if you if you, than if you don't work so that i was just pointing to the notion of power how should we view it should we view it entirely one sided or should we view it as a as a as a in in layered kind of notion you know that power is layered at very high at one level but percolating to well what not percolating but also uh, you know getting sort of some share getting down getting distributed at other level some share of it, but never equal so i was just trying to say that you know women should realize that they are not if they if they the very fact that if they realize that they are not powerless totally powerless that itself will give them some power you know? rather than if you think that we are so powerless anyway so what can we do so i was just trying to trying to suggest that women yes. should realize that they also have power that's about all but i may be wrong yes any any other Yes, sir. <coughs> okay. You might like to sure. ask something, sure. Doctor. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mukhya. That was a really wonderful lecture. Uh, I I know that you have critiqued periodization, the idea of the medieval, or the idea of the modern as a European monopoly here, and I have heard you elsewhere also, uh, where you have critiqued the notion of periodization. uh or the notion the newer notion of the early modern for example uh yes. so right. i was just wondering about your ideas about what the writing of history might look like beyond the domain of periodization uh, 
<laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> it's a very tough question, but I have also sort of uh, had uh, commitment on this part. You know, uh, a two things. One is that you know the notion of periodization, periodization came at a certain time, you know, at a certain conjuncture in the 16th, 17th century. In a certain certain context, it came, uh, and any notion which comes in a certain conjuncture is a transient notion. By its very nature, it's a transient notion. Uh, so, theoretically, even this notion have to uh, have to move away, have to has to disappear at one time or the other. But secondly, uh, I. I'm, I think you are familiar with this question of mine. How will 20th century, the century, modern century, century of modernity par excellence, or 21st century, or 19th or 20th century par excellence, modern, modern centuries par excellence, how will they be looked upon uh, in the 23rd or 24th century? Will, they, will it be called modern? Will these two centuries be called modern? Very unlikely. Uh, not medieval and ancient, obviously, but not even modern. Why? Because the notion of modernity would have undergone very great transformation by then. What we understand as modern today would be considered <laughs> probably very backward. Well, I'm putting it strongly, probably very backward or, or something, you know, in the two centuries from now, three centuries from now. So what will they call the 20th century? Not modern. Then how will they call it? Uh, so my suggestion is, that uh, 200 years, or maybe 100 years, maybe 200 years, maybe whatever number, 100 years here, uh, there would be new, just as there was a new concept in the 17th century between of ancient, medieval, and modern of periodization, there is bound to be a new concept of periodization, if there is a concept of periodization at all. Uh, periodization, which is value loaded, you see, my objection to it is not uh, that it's periodization. You can simply call it 16th century, 18th century, 7th century, 4th century, whatever, you know. But my, my problem with it is, it is that it's value loaded. You know? And you can't get away from the value load in much of, uh, from modern, from modern or medieval, whichever way, you, early modern, postmodern, whatever, whatever. You can't get away. From. So my suggestion is that, uh, that some other terminology is bound to emerge uh, in, uh, I don't know when, but is bound to emerge which is bound to replace this kind of terminology of periodization, or possibly the very notion of periodization, which is value-loaded. Value neutral, maybe yes, but value-loaded, I'm very, very, very doubtful whether it can be. But that's a wild guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's what you said, you know, in that yes, uh, yes. Yeah, article yeah, I, in Hindu, that uh, every period, every period in history uh, could be uh, considered as modern. Well, that, that's a very polemical kind of challenging kind of uh, uh, statement. But I'm, what I'm really suggesting is that let's uh, get down to we have we have been we have lived with these value loaded terms long enough. Let's get down to value neutral terms of of uh, time period in history. That's all I'm saying. Not, I mean, saying, calling every period modern period is actually not, not much of a solution, but that was just sort of being provocative. But, uh, but you know, we have to, we have to think of value neutral terms. Yes? Professor Atnabali Chatterjee is with us. Oh, and she you? has a question. Hello, Dr. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Pratnavalidi has asked, I am particularly interested sharing in your for formulation of sharing of power in a, and in a class society ideology plays a very important part. What I find difficult is to form a historical basis for mapping this. This is only a basic question. Yeah. Yeah, form a historiographical basis for ma mapping this. Yes, uh, I, I'm not sure whether I understood your question, Ratnabali, but as I understand it, that, you know, 
uh, ideology plays a very important part, uh, which is in a class society, so any society for that matter, it plays a very important part. Uh, but uh, difficult to form a histor historiographical basis for mapping this. I couldn't really, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't really fully understand the, what is it that you mean by historiographical basis for mapping this. If you, if you, if, uh, you know, uh, if you mean that, you know, uh, uh, at what time is the ideology, <clears throat> role of ideology in, in uh, social transformation uh, as, as perceived as more crucial, more uh, decisive than at other time? I don't know if that is what you mean. Uh, then, yes, you are right. You know, it's a, it's a very difficult, difficult to say at this time the ideology played more important than uh, role than other other aspects of history did. That would be difficult. But in any case, you know the the role of ideology as the as a as a determining factor of in, in history is a very uh, very sort of open ended, very open ended uh, problematic. It's very very difficult to uh, su suggest any definitive answers so for a very 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 ambiguous kind of uh, theme. But I think it certainly does mean that you know we have uh, we have overlooked greatly overlooked the you know in our in our uh, search for material materialist history history of history in terms of entire materialist explanation of history which is crucial certainly crucial. But we did under underplay, uh, understate and underplay that ideology uh, that is not as Marx had said, uh, it's not your it's not your uh, it's not your it's your being which determines your uh, what is it? It's, it's not your being which determines your ideology or something. It's your ide sorry. It's not your being which determines your ideology. It's your ide I'm putting it all wrong. It is not your ideology which determines your being. It is your being which determines your ideology. Uh, that's Marx's statement. What thirteenth thesis on your part. Now I think it's a it's a it's a, it's a very uh, very dubious formulation uh, of Marx. You know? I think uh, putting one. Uh, over the other, putting one in opposition to the other, either one or the other, forcing you to make a choice. I think it's a very, very uh, doubtful proposition. I think uh, sometimes the ideology, ideological formulations are crucial in form, form, forming social movements, social upheavals, social, uh, social structures even, and sometimes it is the other way around. So it has to be... Uh, it's it's you know we we have been used to a uh, you have uh, we have been used to a static structure of hierarchy of causes you know uh, this is these are many causes but this is the 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 the, the last instance you know last instance is Engels' words La, in the last instance the economy which determines social change or economic change or political change or whatever historical change. This last instance is a very doubtful proposition. There is no last instance. There is always, uh, sometimes it is this factor, sometimes it is. Bangladesh came into being not because of uh, economic exploitation, but because of language. Language as an ideology was the decisive factor in the creation of Bangladesh. Not that there was no economic exploitation, but language or culture uh, or ideology, if you like, was the decisive factor which created Bangladesh. So that, you know, uh, things will vary. The, the We have to think of moving structures of hierarchy of causes, you know, rather than a given fixed structure, permanent structure of hierarchy of causes. Every, every conjuncture, every situation will have a different combination of hierarchy of causes rather than... I don't know if I, if I answered your question, probably I'm not... But uh, uh, I, as I said, I couldn't fully understand your question. So please forgive me if uh, uh, I didn't try to evade the question. But I, please forgive me if I couldn't understand and could be unanswered. But I'm glad, Ratnagali, that you, are, you you listen to me and you ask. Me. Yeah.
Ratnavali is saying that thank you for making us think. And I have so many questions. But the foremost is how to counter the communal propaganda which is taking root in popular common sense. And actually, yes, yes, she exactly. was, yeah. And actually, yes, she was um, talking about the reading texts like Theon's in Vaishnavism. About that, so she was uh, talking the ideological I see, I see, thing. I yeah. See, I see. Okay. Anyway, anyway, yes, that is the main uh, problem today. You know, the kind of it's very interesting that the kind of history uh, being talked about, like in this group, professional group of professional historians or professional students of history, even students group, undergraduate students group, uh, they are doing a lot of this kind of work. The kind of history that is discussed there is so totally professional, so totally discipline oriented. And the kind of history that you go out on the street or go to a TV channel or go to a social media, WhatsApp, you know, and the kind of history that, but that kind of history uh, is, you know, uh, it sort of, it's a, it's a part of the political uh, process that is being unleashed on India. So fighting, History is one aspect of it, one important part of it. But by changing history or by by preserving history's integrity, you are not able to fight that political change which is being raked upon Indian society and Indian policy. So that is a much bigger battle, namely the the battle of uh, fighting the fighting during the political political transformation that is taking place, and therefore political transformation uh, based upon a social transformation that that is being take, that is okay. taking place at the by the regime by the regime itself. so we have to we have to we have to prepare for a much bigger and longer battle than, uh, than history is important but you know, there is something much more important than history. Um, uh, professor, yes, is the term you used uh, democratization of gods that happened in the medieval times? Uh, That's a very interesting way to explain uh, yeah. the margins of um, idols and icons in the medieval period, uh, worshipped yeah. by the lower classes. That's very interesting. Yeah. The way you explain it. Well, okay. Yes, that that's the most most obvious and most important. When uh, Kabir sort of hits out at, uh, I don't know if you have if you are familiar with Kabir's Doha. You know, uh, uh, I mean, think of it. Kankar Patthar Jodi ke Masjid Lai Chunai. Kankar, you know, you pick up pebbles from here and there and erect a mosque. Kankar Patthar Jodi ke Masjid Lai Chunai. Tachari Mullah Bang De Kya Behra Hua Kudai. On top of that Masjid, the Mullah calls out Azan. Azan, he says, Bang. Bang is the crow, I'm sorry, cox croaking. Burga. Burga ka bang is burga ki bang, you know, the cock when it croaks in the morning, that is called bang. So he says, Azan ko he is calling bang, like cock croaking, croaking of cock. So he's. Mullah is what is his Azan is like a mullah ki, like a cock croaking. So, I mean, such ridicule of, uh, and similarly, Hindu, Hindu, uh, uh, if you, uh, you worship a stone, if by worshipping a stone you go, you achieve God, then I would worship a mountain. Better than that is that chakki uh, for grinding corn, that is at least give you some food. Yeah, some, something to sustain. You know? What does a stone uh, statue give you? Uh, so that you know, is ridiculing these rituals of both Muslims and Hindus and so, totally ridiculing. and many others of this kind. So he was he was really uh, making fun uh, and uh, 
Therefore, he was saying to everyone, God is inside you. Don't go to a mosque. Don't go to a temple. Don't, don't go any, anywhere. Just worship your God inside you. He is inside you. Whether you are Hindu or you are Muslim, whether you do it like a Hindu or a Muslim or whatever, just, just worship your God inside you. That is the democratization. So, taking away uh, the power of religion from the mullahs and pandits and handing it and them over to the people themselves. Mm -hmm. That is the democratization of God. Yes. I think Professor Ranavit Chakraborty yes. has posed a question. He says that the possibilities of sharing power in spite of asymmetry, what you termed as seepage of social and cultural norms from the lower strata to the upper echelons of the society, there is always that role of appropriation. Appropriation, on the other hand, is neither an innocuous nor an innocent process, but highlights sharp asymmetry. Yes. What yes. do you think? Right. Uh. Well, absolutely, you know, uh, but you know, uh, uh, appropriation has, uh, you know, I'm not very, uh, very uh, happy with the term appropriation because appropriation really means, uh, you know, some kind of a conspiracy as it were, you know, some kind of a design to uh, take away the, uh, take away the, you know, let's, let's say, I gave you two or three examples. The example of uh, 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 Jahan burning her hand and Shah Jahan distributing charity because as as it happens in the village. Where is what is he appropriating, and how is he increasing the enhancing the asymmetry by by doing the same thing as villagers do, or by the other example I gave was. That you know, uh, he is by by uh, appropriating the uh, asymmetry of families, marrying families between the bride giving and the bride taking family, the asymmetry of it. He is he is not appropriating in the sense of that he thought about it and so on and so forth. You know. Seepage is a is a very a very silent kind of phenomenon. You know, it occurs without you knowing it. But having done that. What is he? How is he enhancing the asymmetry vis-à-vis -vis the Hindu society by by not letting his daughters marry? So that you know, asymmetry is there. Certainly, is there. Surely, but you know, appropriation has a kind of uh, 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 kind of you know conspiracy to it. You know, by the ruling class of depriving uh, somebody else of of his of his resources. You know, of their resources. And appropriating the resources, um, it happens. Does happen. It has. It does happen. Of course, that part of his thing. But not every kind of uh, uh, seepage is an uh, is an uh, appropriation. That's that's what I'd like to suggest here. But it's an it's an open question. It's a there is no definitive answer. To this. I think it's uh, two hours now. So I think uh, my. 82 year old throat needs some rest, I think. <laughs> yes? Koshika. Koshik, uh, I think you should not take any more questions. Uh, yeah, please. Because think, yeah. uh, sir is very tired. Uh, can you hear me? You can record your time. Uh, prof professor, uh, it was wonderful this evening. The, uh, your talk, uh, we enjoyed so much. You, uh, as I said, you uh, gave us a uh, overwhelming uh, and such a good canvas, large canvas, but uh, not missing out the details. It was really, really well, wonderful. It's a wonderful thing we enjoyed with you. Very, it's very, a pleasure, very. both a pleasure and a privilege. It's, it's my, my, and my husband is saying it's, Thank a, you so a, much, sir, it's edifying uh, the and way you engaging. spoke mm -hmm. and engaging many, also. Many, many thanks. Many, many yeah. thanks. I'm very, very. Right. And such yes. a vast, very vast canvas. canvas. Too vast, actually. Very vast. Thank yes, and you, my, <laughs> very vast canvas. And you can now hear some. Uh, enjoyed we the notion of the details also. 
Yeah. Well, you while giving the, the like over, overviewing. Yes. Okay. Thank you so very, much. Very, very thanks. I'm very, very grateful. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, just to officially <laughs> official vote of thanks. Official vote of thanks, uh, uh, proposal of this. So Aditya is a young young member of our organization. He will okay, propose the vote of yeah. thanks. Lovely to hear a young person. Yes. Dinner Motoni, Amade Achke, Shuchirunamoi Kalochana Sheshadi Keshagatse. I mean the Anushani Bhavak to Honovat Gapon Kote Chai Amadir Shavarake, Honovadho Adapok Mukia Unake Shunte Parata, Amadir Gatsakta, Borbir Bishoy, Utuntanundir Bishoy Amadir Shonger Roetsen, Adapok Protainat, Adapika Shachandagos, Adapika Utara Chakravoti, Adapok Ronovich Chakravoti. In other two, Amra, Donovat Japon Kote Sai, Amade Shuchi, Jara Kajunir Bahishamiti Shadoshu, Tade Proteke, Shahel Tamra Shakshama Pitaki, Arava Made Kashi, Donovade Patro, our Jader Kotabul Nabul Haina, Amade Ipuru Duke Jara, Shapule Shang Egini Zete, Sharbotu Havi Shahata Kurzolece, Amade Sotabun Duder Kamra, Donovat Janate Sai. আমরা অনুরোধ করব আপনারা আমাদের সঙ্গে সঙ্গে থাকুন পাশে থাকুন আমাদের এগিয়ে যেতে সহায়তা করুন যেভাবে আপনারা আমাদের সঙ্গে গত তিনটে লেকচারে এবং আজকের লেকচারেও ছিলেন আমাদের পূর্ববর্তী লেকচারগুলো আমরা ইউটিউব চ্যানেলে দিয়ে দিতে শুরু করেছি আপনারা সেখানেও আমাদের সঙ্গে থাকবেন এটাই কামনা করি আর একটা ঘোষণা রয়েছে আমাদের আমরা অধ্যাপক চিন্তাহরণ চক্রবর্তী স্মারক বক্তৃতার কথা আগেও জানিয়েছিলাম অধ্যাপক রণবীর চক্রবর্তী এবারে আমাদের সেই স্মারক বক্তৃতা দেবেন নভেম্বর মাসের প্রথম সপ্তাহে সেটা অনুষ্ঠিত হবে আপনারা আমাদের সঙ্গে থাকুন আমাদের পেজে আমরা এই ব্যাপারে আরো জানাতে থাকব আমাদের সমস্ত আগামী কর্মসূচির ব্যাপারে ধন্যবাদ শুভ রাত্রি সকলকে ধন্যবাদ থ্যাঙ্কস 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 সুচিকে অনেক ধন্যবাদ আমাদের Exactly, yes. Exactly. 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 Ex